Ben, Captain America, Widow, and Hawkeye would arrive to the downtown area of New York as the Chitauri would begin to descend upon the city. Iron Man had been in the air battling as many of the flying creatures as he could and Thor wasn't too far behind. Seeing the civilians that were still needing to be evacuated, that was where their first priority would be. Ben would transform into the alien cannon bolt, moving around and bulldozing his way through hordes upon hordes of Chitari, creating opening lanes for various people to escape and to get to safer grounds. Eventually, the makeshift team would finally assemble together, save for Dr. Banner who was still on his way, and, as Tony put it, to let him know when he arrived. They would continue to work together battling against the strays of Shatari, as Ben would continue to clear through the streets, eventually running into some familiar faces. It came in the form of the rust bucket. Stepping out would be his grandpa Max, decked in his shield armory with his weapons trained and ready for a fight. And pulling up beside him would be a green charger, where both Gwen and Kevin would be waiting as well. But there was also someone else inside of the rust bucket. Someone that Ben hadn't seen in quite a while. It was Julie. Julie Yamamoto, Ben's former girlfriend and pro tennis player. She just happened to be in the city for an upcoming match, and despite things not ending on the best of terms, she did still view Ben as a friend, and she couldn't say she didn't feel anything for him. She wanted to see how he was doing, but it just so happened he was yet again involved in another world-ending situation. Julie was accompanied by her pet, a galvanic mechamorph, known as Ship. Although, you could say that in terms of the mechamorphs, Ship was akin to what a dog would be. It still had the same powers and functions as Ben's alien upgrade, but in a more family-friendly, canine sort of way. Seeing as how she couldn't ignore times of need, she decided to put things on hold and to help out with the situation. For better or for worse, Ben was happy to see her again. Grandpa got them all up to speed on what was happening, and they would get to work helping to evacuate the civilians and fight off the Chitari, while Ben would continue to roam through the streets, taking out massive horde after horde of the Chitari as they continued to funnel through the portal that hovered over New York. Eventually, Ben would find himself with the core group of Avengers, as Dr. Banner would arrive on a moped, and Cap would let Stark know that the Doctor had arrived. Just then, a massive worm-like creature that was flying through the air and following Stark would come heading their way, what Stark called a party. That was when the Doctor decided that now was his turn to take stage. Of course, the Cap suggested that now was a good time for him to get mad. However, Dr. Bennett would simply turn to the group and smile as he wanted to tell them that that was the secret the way he'd figured out how best to control his power. Because the truth is, he's always angry. Without any hesitation, Dr. Banner would quickly transform into the Hulk, punching away at the large flying worm-like creature and knocking it to the ground with a single strike. Everyone would gather together in a circle as the Chitari began to surround them, with Cap giving everyone their orders and sending them to their proper locations to help deal with the threat. For Ben, he was tasked primarily with figuring out a way to close the wormhole once and for all. After all, Blue Kick and Dribba had said if they simply destroyed the mothership, then that would be the best way of getting rid of all of them in one fell swoop, and the mothership had to be coming through the wormhole sooner or later. Ben would turn into his alien Big Chill and would fly directly into the air with Thor close behind him. Thor would slow down the other Chitari soldiers and make an opening for Ben. As he flew through the wormhole, it would lead him directly into space. This is where Ben had to be careful. While an alien like Big Chill could survive in an open space, it didn't mean all his aliens could. But at the same time, 
he was going to need a lot of firepower if they were going to bring the mothership down. For now, the best thing he'd use was Big Chill's abilities, transforming into ultimate Big Chill, shooting out fire that was so cold it burns, freezing through horde upon horde of the Chitari, while Thor would come striking in with bolts of lightning. The two would work side by side together as they took it on the Chitari Armada, while the other Avengers would be working on the ground below. Gwen and Kevin would also find themselves in the downtown area battling against the Chitari, and they came face to face with Captain America and Black Widow. Of course, the captain doing his due diligence knew enough about the kids from the information in the dossiers that he had seen about Ben, and he was congratulatory for them to have arrived when they did. All the help that they could get could make things a lot easier. Seeing an opportunity, Kevin, being of Osmosian descent, would grab hold of the captain's shield, absorbing the material and transforming his entire body into the indestructible metal that was vibranium. Oh crap, it's the real deal, Gwen. What? It's vibranium. It's one of the rarest metals in the world. Technically, it's not even from this planet. Although, trying to find it is super, super rare. You gotta let me know where you got your stash, Cap. I got this from an old friend. I don't think you'll be finding any anytime soon. But, you can put it to good use. Right now, we need to be focused on keeping the streets clear and the people safe. You two take the east and the west. I'll take the north. Will, you take the south. With their orders being given, each one would move in a different direction. For Kevin, having absorbed the vibranium shield into himself and now turning his body into it, he could feel the full properties of the metal on display. For one, his running, he felt faster, almost as if he were as light as a feather, but his punches, they were stronger than any steel. In fact, he started punching through the Chitari almost effortlessly. It felt like he wasn't even trying at this point. And then there was Gwen. Using her mystical ability, she was beginning to clear through as many of the Chitari as she could. But the direction that she moved into, it brought her into contact with someone that she didn't think she'd meet. In a rather peculiar building that seemed to be an eyesore in the middle of New York, given its functionality, Known as the Sanctum Sanctorum, Gwen noticed Chitari gathering at the rooftop. She thought that there were maybe civilians trapped up there and she went to see what was going on, only to find a woman dressed in monk-like robes, displaying magic, fighting off against the various Chitari and taking them down with ease. The woman had what appeared to be a glowing stone around her neck as she quickly turned to see Gwen Tennyson. Ah, another magic user. And... Funny thing that you should arrive here, of all places. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I thought that there were people here who needed my help. I saw the attacks and it's quite alright, child. Actually, I believe if you and I work together, we can clear this section in no time. Um, yeah, I, I just... You have a lot of questions. And honestly, I have questions that are starting to puzzle up myself. But we'll get to those in due time. Gwen, was it? E yes. Um, who... Who are you? Oh, you can call me Miss Yao, Miss Tennyson. At your service. In the meantime, through the air of New York skies, Iron Man would be flying as he blasted away multiple riding Chitari. But he wouldn't be alone as from out of nowhere, a girl in what appeared to be a mechanized suit of black and green would come flying right next to her. The suit was a bit clunkier, it had an actually large jetpack, but the fact that she was able to keep up with the Mark 7 that was rather impressive. It looked just like that alien Ben had used. What the? Ben, is that you? 
Uh, no, sir. Sorry. Oh, oh, uh, someone else. Wait, hold on. There's another Omnitrix? N no, I get that from time to time, though. Um, uh, it's a little complicated, but I have a pet alien that can turn into any form of tech that I want. Pet aliens. Okay, I've definitely heard it all, but the tech looks familiar. Say, you think you could spare some of that? Huh? You know, some of the goop. I don't need a lot of it. Just a little bit. That's all I need. Julie was very much aware of who the famed Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man, was. And seeing as how this was a desperate situation, if she could do anything to help, she wouldn't mind. Asking for Ship to shed a little piece of himself, she globbed it on to Iron Man's armor as it quickly took hold and upgraded the Mark VII, officially becoming the Upgrade Armor. Whatever this ship was, this alien-like mechamorph, Stark was definitely going to want to study it further. But for now, Jarvis would acclimate the powers of the mechamorph into his suit as it increased its firepower and ferocity a thousandfold. The Avengers, along with Ben's close allies, would be making much progress against the Chitauri, more so than even in the original timeline. With more people helping out and defending the city, it made the Chitauri's efforts a lot more futile. However, the World Security Council, the ones whom were directors over S.H.I.E.L.D., still had their misgivings and believed that the island of Manhattan was better off being nuked out of existence, of defeating the enemy in one fell swoop before they could eventually lose everything. Of course, in the meanwhile, Ben, while continuing the battle against the Chitari and eventually having to leave the wormhole to deal with various strays that were getting to descend upon the very streets of the city, there was an ambulance truck that was weaving through lanes trying to get people to the hospital. One truck in particular had Jatari falling upon it, and they were quickly getting overrun. Ben would quickly transform into Echo Echo, transforming the Echo Echo into multiple Echo clones, as they would all descend upon the Jatari, sending out seismic screens in order to stop them. All right, everyone, get into position. Protect the ambulance. Roger, Roger, ditto. Echo, 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 echo. The sounds of the massive echo, echo defense barrier, creating a defensive barrier of sound that would block out all of the Chitari sending them back a good couple of blocks. As those within the ambulance would look out to their savior, the Echo Echoes would quickly merge back into one, as the small white alien would look up towards the driver in question. He appeared to be a man in his mid-thirties. He looked on his lapel badge. It said, Ben. Your name's Ben, huh? Yeah, Ben, Ben Parker, Ben Tennyson, you're doing good work, sir. We'll escort you. Get out of the city. Uh, yeah, thanks. With that, the driver of the ambulance would quickly leave with those in tow, as Ben would set his sights fighting against the enemy once more. Much to Fury's chagrin, the council would overrule his decision and would send the fire jet to the city with a nuclear missile in hand ready to blow everything sky high. In the meantime, Widow had finally reached the top of Stark Tower where Dr. Selvig was and where Loki had left the scepter. Unfortunately for Loki, if an encounter with Thor wasn't enough, his encounter with the Hulk left him beaten and in a crater. The scepter in hand was the key to shutting down the machine, and thankfully Dr. Selvig had finally regained his senses. Widow now had a way of stopping the portal once and for all, 
but they had an even bigger matter to deal with, and that was the nuke heading straight for them. Iron Man and Ben would quickly move towards the nuke to intercept it, with Ben transforming into Jet Ray, and with Iron Man using his newly improved upgraded suit, the two would guide the missile together, launching it towards the lead ship of the Chitari that was now starting to make its way through the wormhole. They could hear through the intercoms that Dribba and Blue Kick were trying to get in contact. You'll want to aim for the center core. That will be the best way to destroy the mothership. I reckon that missile should have more than enough power to get the job done. Once you're able to blow it up, all the Chitauri that are currently on the planet will become little more but paperweight. But you're gonna need to be fast. Once that nuke goes off and the portal will start to close, you'll have to get out of there as soon as possible. Yeah, got that. All right, kid, you ready? Yes, sir. Together, they would guide the missile straight towards the heart of the mothership. As it began to blow, they would make their turn and quickly leave out of the wormhole, escaping just in time as it began to shut. Huh. We make a pretty good team, sir. Yeah. Uh, what the heck? The little piece of chip that Stark had been given was all but used up. Without it having any form of consciousness, it would eventually use itself to completion and Stark used a lot of energy to get the missile guided into the wormhole, effectively leaving his suit without much power to save himself from landing. It's okay, sir. I got you. I got you. I... What the? Weep, 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 weep. In a flash of red, Ben's Omnitrix had finally timed out. It was one of the few bugs that he didn't particularly enjoy about it, and if he survived this, he was going to give Azmuth an earful. Thankfully though, before the two of them would collide with the ground and turn into mush on the pavement, the Hulk would quickly jump into the air, grabbing both of them and allowing them to descend to the ground, all intact. But now, even with the Chitari defeated, there still left the matter of Loki to deal with as he finally crawled out of the crater he had been beaten into, he saw the Avengers waiting right for him. And they were not too keen. But for Loki, his plans ruined, his ambitions brought to an end. The only thing he could do was look to Stark, tired and defeated, If it's all the same to you, I think I'll have that drink now. The battle was won. The Chitari and the cleanup that would be involved would definitely be massive, but still, like all cities, they would have a chance to rebuild once again. Thor would take along with the Tesseract and with Loki as his prisoner back to Asgard where he'd have to pay for his crimes. As for Ben, he'd take time to reconvene with his family and with his friends, hearing all about their experience in the Battle of New York. For Kevin, even though it was only temporary, absorbing that vibranium, it left a little something with him. I don't know why, but I feel like I can sense it now. You can sense vibranium? Gwen would ask. Yeah, typically any sort of material that I absorb, it usually leaves a faint trace within me. I can usually pick back up on something rather simple. For example, whenever I absorb wood, I can just naturally sense wood. But what if you're in a forest surrounded by trees? Then I don't really need to sense it. But with something rare, especially like this, if there's any more of it out there, I could potentially find it. All I need is a sliver and I can get rich. Get rich, Ben would say. How much is vibranium worth? What it's worth? What is it not worth? You could probably buy a couple of small countries with just a little piece of it. And the major companies, major worlds, 
they'd pay top dollar to get their hands on vibranium. I mean, it's a black market material all across the galaxy, not just on Earth. Must be high quality. You know it. Although, I could use it right about now. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because I was just on my way <laughs> to the DMV <laughs> when you gave me that call. Yeah. Gwen, did you take a look outside of my car? As Ben lowered down the window to see, he understood. The car was more than just scratched or dented. It was, um, yeah, it was going to cost a lot to fix. I hope your government boys have a way of paying for this. Hey now, Grandpa said that you'd be reimbursed. Well, you better. You have to treat a car like you treat a woman, Ben. Again. Go on. I mean, you know what I mean. Well, if it's any consequence, if you treat a woman like you do treat your car, she'd be one lucky woman. Ben would say. He looked down at his phone and saw that he had a mixed text. It was from Julie. As he read through the contents, he couldn't help but have at least a little bit of a smile. They weren't getting back together or anything, but at the very least, she was kind enough to ask how he was doing and to make sure that everyone was all right. All in all, this was a fun, anxiety-inducing adventure. And for Ben, it opened his horizons to so many new things. Other heroes beginning to pop up into the world. It didn't feel so lonely anymore. As for Fury and as for S.H.I.E.L.D., they were continuing their own rebuild as well. And they were looking into it just as much. It wasn't just Ben, but the world was truly filling with unique and powerful individuals, all of whom that could one day be brought into this fold, this ever-evolving world, a world filled with extraordinary people who could make extraordinary changes. As Coulson would join Fury at his side as they stood in the helicarrier that was being reformed. He couldn't help but ask his old friend if this is what he planned. When you came up with the Avenger initiative, is this what you wanted? I believe I got more than what I could want for Coulson more than just a response team. Something even greater. You know, a lot of people aren't going to agree with you on this. They think that they're dangerous. They surely are. And now our enemies will know it. Every world will know it. Some sort of threat? No. A promise. This concludes Ben 10 Ultimate Heroes. What if Ben 10 was in the MCU? Season 1, Part 5, the Season 1 Finale. Again, I want to take the time to say thank you to everyone who has been very supportive of this very, very, and I mean very late addition to Anime Marvel Phase 3 Part 1. Again, this series, I want it to be like my own thank you to everyone who has supported me, who has been very much a driving factor for this series. Again, when I first made What If Ben 10 Was In The MCU... I was in a very different point in my life. 
um, very different from where I am now. And honestly, the fact that you gave me so much support back then, the way you've supported me now, we're coming up on the four year anniversary of Power Core Productions. Just hit 5,000 subs and at the pace we're going, we might even hit 6,000 before the year is over. And I can't say enough thank you. I can't do it without you. You make the channel grow. You make the core grow. I appreciate you all. I love you all. I'm thankful for all of you. The fact that you take the time out of your day to watch my stuff, listen to my stuff. And I mean, I don't even think I'm that good compared to a lot of other what if storytellers. Like I'm trying to get to a better level each and every day. So the fact that the people who come through, whether it's just a small number of people or a large number of people, any of my videos, when you take the time to watch them, all I can do is show appreciation and just say thank you. Um, I didn't get to finish uh, What If Borto Was a Sorcerer. We're actually going to wrap that up next week because the script was a lot longer than it was originally going to be. And instead of it being a 10 part series, I'm moving it to a 12 part series. So the final four parts are going to be next week, Monday to Thursday. Next Thursday, we will officially finish with phase three, part one of the Fallout Saga Tales to Astonish. So I hope you all are ready. Um, if you haven't, please check out this story check out the boruto story check out everything and stick along because once we're finished with part one we have parts two and three and there's so much to show and i can't wait to get into it but anyway that's going to do it for the end of today's video i'm javon harrington with power core productions and podcastings signing off and i'll see you next time Is that supposed to be a threat? No. It's a promise. The TV would be paused as two individuals looked upon its screen. One dressed in a rather unorthodox style and the other looking like a common everyday businessman who rubbed the temples of his forehead at the frustration. Uh... Mr. Paradox, do you see anything wrong with that? On the contrary, I see two friends persevering through trial and tribulation and... Ha uh ha, -huh, enough with the preamble, bull. You and I both know what's wrong here. That guy, Mobius would point to Coulson. That guy is not supposed to be alive. He is supposed to be dead. That was never actually confirmed. For all we know, that could have been a life model decoy and... Oh, come on, don't try and give me that retcon bull. We already know what's up here. We're the TVA, Time Variance Association. We can't allow this to happen. I don't care if it's just a butterfly that's sat on a stone five minutes too early. Just the littlest of things can have grave consequences. I don't think he meant any harm by it. His friend was going to die. What did you expect the boy to do? He has one of the most powerful weapons in the universe at the palm of his hands. And I'd like to say that the boys used it rather responsibly. I'm not questioning the boy's ethics. I already know that he's a hero, that he does what he's supposed to do, even though technically his world is an anomaly world. Because look, this is where the original comes from. You see anything here that's a little different from this one? There's no Iron Man, there's no Thor, no Captain America. None of them exist in the original home world. His world is just a variant world. How it came to be, I have no idea. It seems like... <sighs> Why am I even getting into this? I've already got enough to deal with all the other variants that have been popping up out of nowhere. More variants, you say? Professor Paradox would ask. Yeah, about a week ago, we had Loki ended up escaping from his original timeline. I don't even know how he did it. That was a whole other situation of mess that went on. 
And for some reason, we decided to bring him into the TVA, thinking everything would be pish, posh, and fine. Now he's off gallivanting with his other variant selves. And if I'm not mistaken, he's been going around collecting more variants upon variants, built some crack team called the Multiverse Avengers, which is technically made up of mostly people who aren't even Avengers. They're anomalies within anomalies. It's like you got two errors. You got an error within an error. I don't even know how you pull that off. Two negatives make a positive? Oh, please, that's just a common misconception. That's just doubling down until things turn out right. But seriously, the guy pulled some wizard ninja who knows what, some samurai boy with a symbiote, uh, what else? Uh, some kid who became Iron Man. I don't even know how it's possible. He has no connection to Iron Man. So how the hell did he even become Iron Man? There's some boy from a world full of gods. He somehow became the embodiment of Thor. There's this other kid who became the soul reaper ghost rider thing. He's in some school, a club full of girls, and he oogles at breast. It, oh, God, no, don't even get me started on his world because there's this other spider guy yeah this other spider guy who ate cursed fingers and became the embodiment of a living curse oh and did i tell you about this other spider man that's been going on this rampaging crusade as of late Ugh, i mean i would have tried to bring in the illuminati myself but that's a lot easier said than done now isn't it start something called the spider society seriously happened like a summer ago terrible 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 and i, I mean look there, there's a group of mutants do you know about the mutants uh the mutants sir um if i'm not mistaken mutants aren't supposed to show in this world until july 22nd 2024 i believe yeah and is it july 22nd 2024 to you well, sir, in this domain, there is no fabric of time. No fabric of time. Yeah, yeah, no fabric of time. <sighs> Look, if it isn't bad enough with all this nonsense that's running around, there's rumors about a guy that's going about trying to conquer all of the multiverse. And I unfortunately have to look into that, so I don't have time to deal with this. Look, I'm taking out the yellow tape. The yellow tape, sir? The yellow tape. We're putting yellow tape on this incident. We're going to let it slide. But no more. None of it. Everything that happens needs to happen for a reason. Your job is to observe. If there is another divergent point, you keep the timeline on track by any means necessary. It seems rather unethical for me to do so, don't you think? You're the one that knows the boy best. Well, you know them all the best. There is only one you, after all. Can you take care of it? I will do my best, sir. I promise you. Good. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go hunt down Deadpool. Deadpool? A rather unsavior character. No, not that Deadpool, his son, Deadpool. Deadpool has a son, a variant son. Some kid named Dingy uh, made a contract with a dog devil and now he can shoot chainsaws out of his dick or whatever. I have no clue. <sighs> Might I suggest a cup of coffee, sir? You seem exhausted. I am. This is all just... This is just one big mess. I need a raise. You need a vacation. I can't afford it.